presence, for your glory, for your word, for your wisdom. for your joy and your peace, your shalom. Speak through me, Lord, I ask that I may only speak what you are saying. Nothing more or less. that you'll give me the boldness to speak what you were saying. And you'll open all of our ears to hear what you are saying. It's your will that matters. It's you that matters. It's your kingdom that matters. Your glory that matters. We want to hear from you, God. We want to hear what you are saying to your church here in Druin. I'm going to try to remain as faithful as I can to this message that I believe God gave me to give today. But I'm not sure how it fits in with everything else that's been happening. That's up to him. But I believe he's given me this message to share. And so I want to be faithful to what he said. Um... Supposed to preach a Mother's Day message, I think. Good, good. I'm glad we agree. Because <laughs> if, because I was, I got this message and it's got nothing to do with, well, it does, but not really directly to do with Mother's Day. And so it was a temptation to, to rethink it. <laughs> but no, no, I've got what I've got here. And if you wanted a Mother's Day message, Take it up with God. That's the way we go about it. <laughs> I'm going to start from reading in Luke chapter 7. The disciples of John reported all these things to him. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the one who is to come? Or shall we look for another? And when the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to, uh, to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? In that hour, he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits, and on many who were blind, he bestowed sight. And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is he, is, sorry, blessed is the one who is not offended by me. The first question in this passage that I wanted to ask was it says, they, the disciples came, or the John's disciples came to John and reported to him all these things. And it was the question, what things? So I went back and looked, what's just before that? In Luke chapter 6, 17 onwards, Jesus came down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there along with a great number of people from all over Judea, Jerusalem, and the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those troubled by unclean spirits were healed. The entire crowd was trying to touch him because power was coming from him 
and healing them all. And following that, in Luke 7, it's, it's, he shares the account of Jesus healing the centurion's servant. You know the great faith of the centurion? And then he raised the widow's son. And in verse 16, it says, A sense of awe swept over all of them, and they glorified God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has visited his people. And from these passages, we can see that there was a great time of glorifying God. Imagine the atmosphere and the excitement of the time and the area for all of these miracles that were being done. Great miracles. The raising of the dead. People were being healed. All sorts of things. A large crowd was there. Disciples were there. And Jesus was performing a lot of miracles. People were rejoicing and they were giving glory to God. What a great place to be. So these disciples, John's disciples, went, back, went to John and reported these things to him. They reported about the miracles, the raising of the dead, the message that pre was preached, the joy of the people, everything. At this point, John had a choice. He could rejoice along with the people or the disciples or even just rejoicing at the fact of hearing this good news. But he chose something different in that time. John had been put into prison. Here is a guy that was anointed by God to prepare the way of the Lord. He said it himself and he quoted who he was. I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. He knew who he was. He knew that Jesus was the son of God who was to come into the world. Because he saw the spirit in the form of a he saw the spirit land on Jesus and remain there. John 1.32 And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. John's disciples came to him and reported what was happening. And in this time, John doubted, doubted. But I did find something interesting here in the word that was used in John's question where he said, or should we expect another? We can look at that word in the English translation and think someone totally different, somebody totally else. It's too easy to read in there that we that he was expecting somebody totally different potentially. The word though is alos. And when translated, it's been translated as another, but it's another of the same kind. It's the same word that was used when Jesus said that, he, that the Father, he'll ask the Father to send another the Holy Spirit. It was another of the same kind. And so it's more than likely that John was, refer was talking about another of the same kind. He knew that the miracles were happening. He had it reported to him that all these good things were going on. And he knew that this, that he, that this was Jesus, the Son of God, but this time of doubt in his mind made him wonder if he'd got it slightly wrong. Is it someone like this? But there's this time of doubt. John had been put into prison because he had challenged Herod for 
his relationship with his brother's wife. And you can imagine, just, just like us, that we would be expecting that by bringing this word of God, the law of God, God's rules into a situation and, and talking to Herod about this, that he would have felt like he was doing God's work. And so he's been thrown into prison for what he believes to be doing God's work. He's been thrown into prison, was going through a, suffer, a time of suffering, and there's this guy that he had baptised who is the Messiah, and he knew who the Messiah, knew it was the Messiah, but he, this time of hardship for him was enough to make him doubt that this was the Messiah. The Messiah, he would have known the scriptures that said to set the captives free, to open the prison door. And here he was in behind bars. This Messiah hadn't at that point met his expectations of what he, what, of what he was expecting. What I love is Jesus' response. As you get to know more and more about Jesus from his word, from revelation from him, you get to see this sort of pattern in here where Jesus doesn't feel that he has to defend himself. He doesn't come back to John and say, yeah, I am. He quotes scripture. Refers to scripture. He says to go back, and I'll read this in a sec. Actually, no, I'll read it now. Did I miss something there? Sorry. No, I've got it. Spirit of the Lord, Jesus' response was, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all those who mourn. Jesus replied with, go back, and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. He didn't have to say to John, yeah, I am. I am the Messiah, believe in me. He said, look at what's going on. He pointed the disciples and John back to the scriptures to show who he was. I wouldn't have liked to have been in John's position, not at all. But Jesus gave the wisest answer possible. It's the same, the first, this is the same scripture that Jesus referred to when he, or even read when he was in the synagogue and he said, now this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing when he declared what we call it's his de declaration of his intention on this earth. And then at the end of his response, what I, the one I read earlier, was blessed... I'm going to read the... No, oh, sorry. Blessed is the one who does not fall away on account of me. And that's an awesome statement in itself. Another way to translate what he said there is happy or blessed or to be envied are those who don't fall away or become offended in me. You know that we can become offended in Jesus and with Jesus. 
I'm sure we've all done it. If we've become offended with Jesus, you're not alone. I guarantee you that. Jesus said of John the Baptist that he was the greatest of all those born of a woman. Yet even he who saw the Messiah, who saw the the dove descending on him and remaining, and who baptised the Messiah, at this time had a doubt. Sometimes we may have had a word or a prophecy spoken over us. Sometimes we might hear from God himself directly. Other times we might take promises from God's word and believe and have complete faith in what we have heard or seen. But the things that we have expected to happen haven't, at least not yet. The Israelites were hoping for a military king, Messiah, who would redeem them from their occupiers, the Romans. And when you read the prophecies about the Messiah, you can read these hopes into them. But Jesus had a much bigger enemy and problem to deal with that Israel and all humanity needed salvation from, sin and death. And I preached this in a a message a while ago too, that God had appointed times for all things. When he sent God, uh, when when God sent Jesus... (laughs) Yeah, well, he sent God. God, Jesus is God too. When he sent Jesus, it was when the time had fully come the Messiah came into the world. How many before that would have been praying for this Messiah who knew he was coming? How many didn't see it? But were praying it. But when the time fully come, Jesus sent. Jesus was sent. And John's expectation and timing were different to what God's plan was. But I want to make a point here. God's timing is always perfect. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 11. God has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. That's going to take some study to get into what that really means. But he has also put eternity into man's heart so that he cannot find out. So eternity is so big, obviously. There's no end to it. And man hasn't got the wisdom of God. God made everything beautiful in its time. Habakkuk 2. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. For years, sorry Sarah if I'm going to embarrass you here, but for years I prayed for my life partner to come along. My wife. I would find the right girl and it would be soon. I'm getting there. (laughs) Thank you though, yes. I prayed for many years for this and I found Sarah. And have been thankful to God ever since. And there's my Mother's Day message. I didn't cry. Hang on. (laughs) There were many times where I was upset and even angry at God. I had friends who had girlfriends. I had lots of friends who were girls. And it was something that I wanted. I never wanted anything more than a godly relationship. But I always wanted whoever it was 
to be the right one that I would marry. I never intended to just go with whoever. And for a long time, and I'm not exaggerating, it was years, they, my prayers were seemingly going unanswered. And yes, there were times where I was upset and angry with God about it. Why have all these other people moving on in their lives like this and I can't? Those sorts of things. But like I said, then God, in the right time, sent the right girl into my life and 17 years later, here we are. Yeah, we've been married for 17 years. A bit older than you. I have also had high hopes of being successful in business. And here I'm talking about the, finan the financial stability, the size of the business to see its growth. And I believe that I was meant to buy the business that I have now. But I can tell you that there are times where I just want to walk away from the whole lot. There's times of absolute frustration. There's times where I doubt that I heard God's voice. There's times where I feel that I'm not hearing God's voice, whether I should continue in it or not. And I have a choice in this whole process where I can be offended to God with God or can doubt God or I can get closer to him. I haven't, don't get me wrong, we have been blessed as a business. The only way that it's still got a business is through God's blessing. That's the first statement there. But I'm not seeing the promises and blessings that I read in the, you now I'm saying I read because it's my reading of it, but the promises and the blessings that I've seen in Malachi when we tithe, and I do tithe. Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are accursed with curse, but you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. Thereby put me to the test, says the Lord. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down a blessing until there is no more need. And I can't say that I've seen it to the way that I read that, to that level. Yes, God is absolutely blessing me. And I still have a business only because of his blessing. But if I read that, the way I look at it now and understand it, I can be, God, what is going on? This is what your word says. And he's okay for us to ask, but not to be offended. In his timing. Another one, again, with finances is the church's finances here have been an issue. And I haven't been on the board the whole time the church has been around. But again, I know God has blessed us. But we could do with some more. <laughs> but in this, I have, and I will be honest, I'm honest that I was offended with God at other things. I'm honestly not offended with him in this. Because in this, I have chosen to believe my provider our provider, that he will provide. And I will not be offended with him on this. So the question I pose is whatever you're going through, how are you responding? Or whatever you will go through, how will you respond? How 
And I've deliberately asked these questions in the present tense and the future tense, but not the past tense. If you haven't given your past to Jesus, I encourage you to do so. You need to do so. But when you have given your past to Jesus, it's not yours anymore. He's dealt with it. The only time that you can go back to your past is to be thankful to him for the forgiveness he gave for it. But the question still stands. How will you respond when you come across hardships and trials? God does not operate in our timing or in our ways. His timing is perfect. But he wants us to stand and to live by faith no matter what we might be going through. We stand. We put on the whole armour of God and stand. We trust in him and his word. He is always with us. And he has said as much. We strengthen ourselves in him. And we strengthen our resolve and patience by his word. His word that in this country we have access to whenever you want to. And I want to put some verses of encouragement up here. Deuteronomy 31.8 It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Isaiah 43.1-2 Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. Matthew 28, Jesus said, And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Romans 8, 31 to 32, If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Colossians 3, uh, 1, uh, 11 to 13. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. No, hang on. I didn't copy and paste that one, right? I'll read it from here. Colossians 1, 11 to 13. Be strength, being strengthened with all power, according to his glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness, and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. And 2 Peter 3, 8-9. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promises as some count slowness, but is patient towards you. God's word is full of promises. We need to strengthen ourselves in his promises. Believe that God gave me this message to share today because he wanted to say that he is there with us. Whatever trials we're going through, whatever joys we're going through, But he is there with us. Because he will never leave us. He'll never forsake us.
The last couple of weeks have been a trial, a lot of the time. Today was hard. As I mentioned in my message, I'm thankful for my wife and this is one of the reasons. She came here a little bit before church. Let's go with two hours before. She put music on. I don't know what else she did other than that. Probably praying. But I walked into the back. We were the next ones here. I walked into the back and I could feel the presence of God. I had struggled to find God's presence today, probably a fair bit of yesterday. But I felt it when I came in here. I sat down out in the back room for a little while and just soaked. Soaked in his presence. As I was sitting there, my eyes closed. Jesus came up, he walked up to me. My arm was like this. He picked me up on the arm. He says, come on, let's go. Burdens left. Instantly freed. So I think there was a bit of extra that I wanted, that I needed to share with this message. And I think this is how it ties into what happened in the start of this service, or before the message. Because his presence is everything. And when we're in his presence, all else cannot stand. Took, it was a different way to, I tried to forget, <laughs> we're not going to do it. I came here and then felt his presence. It left, the burdens left. Yes, it is absolutely important to be reminding our, ourselves of what he says in his word. But his presence is so important as well. And what we felt in, in here, in the worship, and thank you for the word about the worship team, you're spot on. It's the worship team. What we felt here in the worship and in the praying afterwards and in the praying during it's God's presence. And how many of us felt uplifted by that? So thank you, God. That your presence is here with us. That you go with us wherever we go. That you go before us. That you lead us, no matter what it is that we might come against. You are there and you are bigger. You are more powerful. And in you, there is absolute shalom, peace, completeness, fullness. Continue to remind us of what your word says. That when we're in times of doubt or struggle, that we will be reminded of what your word says. That what you have declared, because all of your words are powerful and they do not return to you void. But they accomplish everything you set them out to do. And so, God, we receive your words for us. Mm 
Strengthen us to be able to keep our focus on where it should be. On you. On things above where you are seated. We thank you so much for your presence and your power. For your glory. Your love. That flows through each one of us if we're willing. Through your Holy Spirit in us. That in you we can find assurance and rest, peace, joy, hope. And not only that, that by your presence in us and through us, we can extend that out to everyone else we come in contact with. That your presence changes things, changes the atmosphere. We thank you, Lord, for your word. Amen.